Chapter One, Part Nine of Commentary on the Gospel of John, Book Six, by Cyril of Alexandria, translated by Reverend Philip Edward Pusey and Reverend Thomas Randall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Fifteen, and I know mine own, and mine own know me, even as the Father knoweth me, and I know the Father without sufficient thought any one might say that by these words the lord wished to signify nothing more than this that he would be well known to his own people and would freely bestow knowledge concerning himself upon those who believe on him and also that he would recognize his own people manifestly implying that the recognition would not be without profit to those whose lot it might be to experience it for what shall we say is better than being known by god but since what is here expressed somehow claims for itself a keener scrutiny especially because he added as the father knoweth me and i know the father come and let us proceed toward such an understanding of the words before us for i do not think that any living being who has a sound mind will say that he has power to be able to attain to such knowledge concerning christ as that which we may suppose god the father has concerning him for the father alone knows his own offspring and is known by his own offspring alone for no one knoweth the son save the father nor again doth any know what the father is save the son according to the saying of the saviour himself for that the father is god and the son likewise is very god we both know and have believed but what their ineffable nature is in its essence is utterly incomprehensible to us and to all other rational creatures how then shall we know the son in like measure as the father doth for we must consider in what sense he declares that he will recognize us and be recognized by us as he knoweth the father and the father him therefore we must also investigate what meaning we shall consistently attach to the words so as not to be out of harmony with the context this we must seek for for my part i will not conceal that which comes into my mind nevertheless let it be accepted only by such as are willing for i think that in these words he means by knowledge not simply acquaintance but rather employs this word to signify friendly relationship either by kinship and nature or as it were in the participation of grace and honour in this way it is customary for the children of the greeks to say they know not only those who are of more distant family relationship but also even their actual brothers and that the divine scripture too speaks of friendly relationship as knowledge we shall perceive from what follows for christ somewhere says concerning those who were not at all in friendly relationship with him many will say to me in that day namely in the day of judgment lord lord did we not by thy name do many mighty works and cast out devils then will i profess unto them verily i say unto you i never knew you again if knowledge means simply acquaintance how can he who has all things naked and laid open before his eyes as it is written who even knows all things before they be how can he be without knowledge of any living beings it is therefore quite unintelligible or rather it is positively impious to suspect that the lord is without knowledge of any and we will rather think that he means to speak of them as brought into no friendly relationship or communion with him as though he says i do not know you to have been lovers of virtue or to have honoured my word or to have joined yourself unto me by good works conformably with this thou wilt also understand what is spoken with regard to the all-wise moses when god says to him i know thee above all other men and thou hast found grace in my sight 
which signifies thou more than any other man hast been brought into friendly relationship with me and has obtained much grace and when we say this we do not take away the signification of acquaintance from the word knowledge but simply attach a more suitable meaning in harmony with our ideas on the subject accordingly when he says i know mine and am known by mine even as the father knoweth me and i know the father it is equivalent to saying i shall enter into friendly relationship with my sheep and my sheep shall be brought into friendly relationship with me according to the manner in which the father is intimate with me and again i also am intimate with the father for just as god the father knows his own son and the fruit of his substance by reason of being really his parent and again the son knows the father holding him as god in truth inasmuch as he is begotten of him in the same way we also being brought into friendly relationship with him are called his kindred and are spoken of as children according to that which was said by him behold i and the children whom god hath given me and we both are and are called the kindred in truth of the son and through him of the father because the only begotten being god of god was made man assuming the same nature as ours although separate from all sin else how are we the offspring of god and in what way partakers of the divine nature for not in the mere will of christ to receive us into friendly relationship have we our full measure of boasting but the power of the thing itself is realized as true by all of us for the word of god is a divine nature even when in the flesh and we are his kindred notwithstanding that he is by nature god because of his taking the same flesh as ours therefore the manner of the friendly relationship is similar for as he is closely related to the father and through the sameness of their nature the father is closely related to him so also are we to him and he to us in so far as he was made man and through him as through a mediator are we joined with the father for christ is a sort of link connecting the supreme godhead with manhood being both in the same person and as it were combining in himself these natures which are so different and on the one hand as he is by nature god he is joined with god the father whereas on the other hand as he is in truth a man he is joined with men but perhaps some one will say dost thou not see o fellow to what a perilous hazard thy argument is leading thee for if in so far as he became man we shall think that he knows his own that is comes into friendly relationship with his sheep who remains outside the fold for they will be all together in friendly relationship because they are men just as he is man why then does he any longer use the superfluous word mine and what is the peculiar mark of those that are really his for if all are in friendly relationship from the above-mentioned cause what greater advantage will those who know him intimately have we say in reply that the manner of the friendly relationship is common to all both to those who have known him and to those who have not known him for he became man not showing favour to some and not to others out of partiality but pitying our fallen nature in its entirety yet the manner of the friendly relationship will avail nothing for those who are insolent through unbelief but rather will be allotted as a distinguishing reward to those who love him for just as the doctrine of the resurrection extends to all men through the resurrection of the saviour who causes to rise with himself the nature of man in its entirety yet it will profit nothing to those who love sin 
for they will go down into hades receiving restoration to life only that they may be punished as they deserve nevertheless it will be of great profit to those who have practised the more excellent way of life for they will receive the resurrection to the participation of the good things which pass understanding in just the same way i think the doctrine of the friendly relationship applies to all men both bad and good yet is not the same thing to all but while to those who believe on him it is the means of true kinship and of the blessings consequent upon that to those who are not such it is an aggravation of their ingratitude and unholiness such is our opinion on this subject but let any one who can do so think out the more perfect meaning now however we must notice at the same time how true and carefully accurate the language is for christ is not found to treat subjects in inconsistent and varying ways but to put every separate thing in its own and most suitable place for he did not say mine know me and i know mine but he introduces in the first place himself as knowing his own sheep then afterwards he says that he shall be known by them and if knowledge be taken in the sense of acquaintance as we were saying at the beginning it might be thou wilt understand something like this we did not first know him but he first knew us for instance paul when writing to some of the gentiles says something of this sort as follows wherefore remember ye the gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands that ye were at that time separate from christ alienated from the commonwealth of israel and strangers from the covenants of the promise having no hope and without god in the world but now in christ jesus ye that once were far off are made nigh in the blood of christ for out of his unbounded kindness christ introduced himself to the gentiles and knew them before that he was known by them and if knowledge be understood as friendship and relationship again we say likewise it was not we who began this state of things but the only begotten son of god for we did not lay hold of the godhead which is above our nature but he who is in his nature god took hold of the seed of abraham as paul says and became man so that being made like unto his brethren in all things except sin he might receive into friendly relationship him who of himself had not this privilege that is man therefore as a matter of course he says that he first knew us then afterwards that we knew him and i lay down my life for the sheep thus he was prepared on behalf of those who were now his friends and relations to afford protection in every way and he promises even willingly to incur peril giving a proof in fact by taking this upon himself that he really is the good shepherd for some abandoning the sheep to the wolves were well designated on that account as wretches and hirelings but since he knew that he must strive on their behalf so vigorously as not even to shrink from death he might with good reason be deemed a good shepherd and by saying i lay down my life for the sheep because i am the good shepherd he covertly rebukes the pharisees and gives them perhaps to understand that one day they would act thus frantically and reach such a pitch of madness against him as to compass the death of one who by no means deserved this but rather was worthy of all praise and admiration both because of the deeds which he wrought and on account of his excellent skill in the duties of a shepherd nevertheless we must remark that christ did not unwillingly endure death on our behalf and for our sakes but is seen to go towards it voluntarily although very easily able to escape the suffering if he willed not to suffer 
therefore we shall see in his willingness even to suffer for us the excellency of his love towards us and the immensity of his kindness sixteen and other sheep i have which are not of this fold them also i must bring and they shall hear my voice and they shall become one flock one shepherd in diverse manners he rattles his blows around the lawless pharisees for that they would almost immediately be thrust out from the charge of the sheep and that in their stead he himself would govern and lead them he intimates by many sayings and he throws out hints that having joined the flocks of the gentiles to the better disposed of israel he will rule not merely the flock of the jews but will at once extend the light of his own glory over the whole earth and call the nations in every quarter to the knowledge of god not suffering himself to be known in judea only as was the case in early times but rather in every country under heaven giving the information which leads to the enjoyment of the true knowledge of god and that christ was appointed to be a guide of the gentiles unto piety any one may learn and very easily for the inspired scripture is full of testimonies to this and perhaps it would not be wrong to pass it over altogether leaving it to the more studious to seek out such passages but nevertheless i will adduce two or three sentences from the prophets concerning this before i pass on to what follows well then god the father somewhere says with regard to christ behold i have given him for a witness to the gentiles a leader and commander to the gentiles for christ bore witness to the gentiles giving them instruction unto salvation and frankly telling them the things whereby they must be saved and the divine psalmist as if calling those in all quarters into one joyous company and bidding all under the sun to gather themselves together to a heavenly feast says o clap your hands all ye gentiles shout unto god with the voice of exultation but if it may seem good to any one to inquire into the cause of such a glorious and noble act of praise he will find it clearly expressed for god is the king of all the earth sing ye praises with understanding god reigneth over all the gentiles and somewhere also he has introduced the lord himself announcing in his own words the evangelic proclamation to all the gentiles together for in the eight and fortieth psalm he says hear this all ye gentiles give ear all ye inhabitants of the world both the low-born and the nobles rich and poor together my mouth shall speak of wisdom and the meditation of my heart shall be of understanding for how shall any one mention anything wiser than the gospel precepts or what shall we find so full of hidden understanding as the instruction which comes through christ therefore for our explanation must revert to what we began with he clearly foretells that the multitude of the gentiles shall be united into one flock with the obedient of israel but for what reason some one who is more keenly searching into the signification of this passage may say does the saviour when addressing the ruler of the jews and speaking to men whose hearts burned with hatred and envy reveal mysteries for tell me why such men should be informed that he would rule the gentiles and that he would gather into his own folds the sheep from beyond the limits of judea what then shall we say to this and how shall we explain it not as to friends does he impart mysteries to these men but neither does he deem the explanation of these matters useless to them on the other hand he thus speaks because he knew it would profit them as much as anything he could do for this was his object although the mind of his hearers being quite obstinate and not yielding to obedience remained inflexible and because he was aware that they knew the writings of moses and the announcements of the holy prophets 
and in the prophets the statements are frequent and abundant that christ was to convert the gentiles also to the knowledge of god on this account he set this matter before them as a most manifest sign that he was clearly the one foreannounced he publicly declared that he would call even those sheep who were not of the jewish fold in order as we said just now that they might believe him to be really the one whom the company of the holy men had foretold seventeen therefore doth the father love me because i lay down my life that i may take it again he replies oftentimes not only to the words uttered at the time with the tongue but to the reasonings in the depth of the heart for being very god he has a clear knowledge of all things accordingly when the unholy jews mocked at his words especially because he promised that he would struggle on behalf of his own sheep to such a degree and so very earnestly that he was actually ready even to die for them thinking that he now talked foolishly and deeming him mad forcibly now at length he shows those who were mockers because of the ignorance and at the same time the unbounded impiety that was in them that they are guilty both in words and in deeds of dishonouring that which god the father recognises as worthy of great honour for the father loveth me he says for this very thing that you through your great lack of understanding so utterly despise are ye not therefore arrogant and chargeable with gross impiety when ye say that it is a fit object for mockery which to god is most acceptable and well-pleasing and somehow also he gives them to understand from these words that they were greatly hated by god for if god loves the one who lays down his life for the sheep of the fold entrusted to his care it is of course necessary to suppose that he holds in detestation the one who beholdeth the wolf coming and leaveth the herd a prey to the prowling and ravenous beast and turneth to flight just what christ had convicted those whose lot it was then to rule the people or flock of the jews of doing at the same time therefore he reproves them both as hated by god and as being ungodly because they did not shrink from laughing at what god honoured most highly moreover christ declares that he was loved by god the father not merely because he lays down his life but because he lays it down that he may also take it again for of course it is in this point especially that the greatness of the benefits he wrought for us appears conspicuous for if he had only died and had not risen again what would have been the advantage and how would he appear to have benefited our nature if he had remained among us dead under the bonds of death and subjected to consequent corruption in the same way as others but since he laid it down that he might also take it again he in this way saved our nature perfectly bringing to naught the power of death and he will display us as a new creation accordingly the son is beloved by god the father not as though he would have remained without that love had not his work for us been done for he was always and at all times beloved and we will proceed towards the comprehension of what is here said the qualities which naturally are inherent in anything or which happen to be possessed by it are most strikingly manifested at any particular time when they are exhibited with special intensity for example fire naturally has in itself its own heat but when it displays it upon pieces of wood then especially we recognize what force and what power there is in it similarly the man who has acquired a knowledge perhaps of grammar or of some other such science would not be admired for it i suppose if he remained silent but rather when he has exhibited to the appreciation of others the excellence of the knowledge he possesses 
in like manner therefore the divine and ineffable nature when it strongly exhibits any of its own inherent qualities or any of the attributes naturally belonging to it at such a time it also is by itself most strikingly manifested and so is seen by us for instance wisdom saith in the book of proverbs i it was in whom he rejoiced and daily i was delighted being always in his presence when he was delighted at having finished the world and was taking delight in the sons of men although joy always belongs to god and his gladness is without end surely nothing whatever grieves him who possesses authority over all yet he rejoices in his own wisdom at having finished the world for when he beholds the energy of his own wisdom exhibited in his work then most especially he thought that he must more abundantly rejoice in this way therefore we will understand what is said in this place for god the father being love according to the language of john and not simply good but rather goodness itself when he saw his own son laying down his life for us through his love towards us and his surpassing goodness keeping unaltered the exact characteristics of his own nature reasonably loved him not bestowing his love upon him as a sort of reward for the things that had been done for us but as we have said beholding in his son that which was true to his own essence and being drawn to love him as if by certain necessary and irresistible impulses of nature therefore just as even among ourselves if any one beholds perchance in his own child the image of his own form exactly represented he is drawn to an intensity of love whensoever he looks at him after this manner i think god the father is said to love his own son who for us lays down his own life and takes it again for it is a work of love to have chosen even to suffer and to suffer ignominiously for the salvation of some and not to die only but also to take again the life that was laid down in order to destroy death and to take away sorrow from the thought of corruption therefore being always beloved by reason of his nature he will be understood to have been beloved also on account of his love towards us causing thereby gladness of heart to his father since he in that very thing was enabled to see the image of his own nature shining forth quite unclouded and unadulterated end of chapter one end of commentary on the gospel of john book six by cyril of alexandria translated by rev philip edward pusey and rev thomas randall